And I started my career on Wall Street like one year before the 1987 crash. You can literally remember every single moment of that day because it was just so insane. It truly was. And it was, it was probably like a great lifetime lesson to me about how things can go wrong so bad so fast and you cannot even imagine. And that's why, you know, that's why I have such a hard time with, with all the, the, the furos on YouTube who like think that, just, you know, if you, if you have a single candle that you can, you can predict future behavior or that, that supply from 1945 on the candle right, is like going to matter. Like I cannot stand ICT. I mean, I just think it's the biggest scam there is. And the whole model of, of brokerage was, it was, it was a dealer based model. So it means you are in off, in off exchange markets. We'll talk about this with difference between futures and, and CFDs in off exchange markets. The dealers are making the market. There's only two positions you really want to have. You want to be flat or you want to be long. Mm, right there. That's a good nugget yeah. right there. Do you know how I know you're not a short? Yeah. You still have your hair. Here's why I love futures prop. What's up traders? Welcome back to the podcast. Today, I'm sitting down with a very special guest. We are in New York City to talk to Boris Schlossberg. Boris has extensive trading experience. He has some very strong opinions and also shares some really awesome trading stories. We talk about the crash of 1987, how it was to be working at a firm when that happened. We talk about even the trading he does today. He shares his opinion on ICT and all the different ways that people think you can make money in markets nowadays. So I think a lot of you guys are gonna enjoy this episode. Please make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you check out the links down in the description. Thank you to our sponsors for making the traveling happen, making these podcast studios happen and uh, helping us grow the show. So. Enough out of me. Let's get in and chat with Boris. Real quick, traders, a break from the video to thank the sponsor, ASFX TV. Now, if you don't know what ASFX TV is, it's our live streaming platform where we trade live New York session and London session every single day of the week. Of course, minus like a bank holiday here or there. But if you want to watch me and our team of funded full-time traders live, navigating the market, calling trades, taking wins, taking losses, managing the trades, and everything in between, come check out ASFX TV. There's a link in the description. We're flying in above my head for a three-day free trial. It's a no-brainer. You got nothing to lose. Come see if there's something to be learned while watching guys who have a combined 20 years of market experience, navigate through the markets. Also, you'll get access to the replays of previous streams. So if you can't be there live, you still can learn, watch and follow along. Again, it's a no brainer. It's three days on a free trial and then $10 per month. So shout out to the ASFX TV team for sponsoring this video. I want you guys to check out that link in the description to come try out the trial. And let's get back to the video. All right, Boris. Yes, sir. Good to have you back on the show. Good to be here. We nice are in your you. neck of the woods today. We are. We are in New York City. We're in Brooklyn, Navy Exciting. Yards. Right. It's going to be good. So let's jump in. Yes, sir. I think that you have some credentials that people maybe don't know about. First of all, when people Google Boris Schlossberg, yeah. a lot comes up. But one thing that stands out is you have an Investopedia page, which I yeah. think is super dope. Do you know how that ever came about? Did that no, just become natural? No, it just came natural. I, and it, it's just a nice way of you saying that I'm super old. That's all it is. You know? <laughs> Not at all. Uh, Not at all. But I yeah. think it's cool because that means you have a, we'll call it tenured experience yeah, in tenured. this industry. Exactly. So I wanted to talk. Graduate from the school of hard knocks. Exactly. Yes. So before we get into it, right. how do you tell people today when you're walking in to get your bagel or your coffee, right. whatever you're doing, when people say, what do you do? What do you say nowadays? I'm curious. What do I say yeah. these days? If, if I'm a stranger and I say, uh, I, I like your watch, you know, you're just hanging yeah. out in sneakers in the middle of the day in a Starbucks, what do you do? What do you, you say know, to those people? I still struggle with an explanation for that because it's, 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 it's such an obscure little land of the world. I usually say I'm just a pretty face on TV. That's what I say. <laughs> and and I, just, I just try to laugh it off for most people because um, it's just a little hard to explain to, to the layman exactly what we do, why we do it, yeah. and, you know, what it's all about. Um, so yeah, I skipped that explanation. Okay. So then let me, let me intro yeah. you. So Bo for those of you that don't know Boris, Boris is a regular contributor on CNBC. Yeah. I think that's a huge part of what you do. Yeah. Boris also runs BKFX with Kathy Lean. BK Traders. BK right. Traders now. Right. And Boris and I today are going to talk with you guys a lot about the futures funding space, the prop yes, funding the prop space, space, all of this right. drama. But before we get into that, of course, we're going to save that for the middle of the episode. Yes. Let's talk about your background. Because yeah. I don't hear about this in any of your other videos, and I think it's really interesting. Again, it's because I'm so old, right? But it's fine. <laughs> it's yes. not that at all. It's not yes. that at all. Yes. So you started yes. at Drexel, Burnham, Dre and Lambert. Yes, 
Drexel, Burnham, Lambert, otherwise known as Drexel, Burnham, and Churnham. What we is just, that? Uh, that was a so Drexel, Burnham, and oh my God, I have to explain this yeah. to you now. This is this is this is there's going to be a lot of people that because don't know. you have to understand Drexel, Burnham, Lambert was literally the firm on Wall Street. Really, it was Michael Milken. If you don't, if you, you have to go back all the way to the 1980s, Junk Bond King. Okay, Michael Milken was the master of the universe. If you ever see the movie Wall Street, yeah, okay, it was based on a, on a guy named Ivan Bosky, who was. The client of Michael Milken, who really? is not like the, the character in Wall Street, is actually the lower level character of who the guy who you know we all work for, who is Michael Milken, who literally owned all of Wall Street. He invented junk bonds. Really? He financed Steve Wynn, by the way. He financed all of, all of Las the Vegas. Casinos. Yeah, the casinos wow. uh, doing it this way. Um, and I came in. I was not involved. Um, he moved to California, and he was he was working out of L.A. I worked out of the New York office, which was literally right next door to the New York Stock Exchange. It's 55 Broad Street. It was really, really a lot of fun. It was, it was the, you know, the, the swinging 80s. And I started my career on Wall Street like one year before the 1987 crash. Really? And I survived. And I was like this young, young puppy on the desk during the 1987 crash, which is still to this day the single most surreal experience of my trading career. I, can it, only I mean, imagine. there you know there are people always remember there are certain days in their life they remember every single they moment. They remember 9/11. Right. They remember their child's birth, right. wedding, Correct. and the crash of 1987. The crash of 87. Yeah, you can really, you can literally remember every single moment of that day because it was just so insane. It truly was, and it was it was probably like a great lifetime lesson to me about how things can go wrong so bad so fast. And you cannot even imagine. You know, one of the interesting things about 1987 crash people absolutely do not understand is that during 1987 crash, we had the greatest rally the stock market had ever seen. Because V bottomed? There was a V bottom at 11 o'clock in the morning. It went up 212 point Dow points, which is the equivalent, I guess, of like maybe 20,000 Dow points at this point. Like imagine a 20,000 Dow point rally um, until about 2.30 2 p.m. And then it died and it just died. And we started just selling, selling, selling. And it was, it was, I mean, I remember grown men crying. I mean, it was at that point, there was many, many specialists on the, on the New York Stock Exchange who had thought they survived this. Literally, that last hour and a half, it, killed them. it bankrupted them. What was your job then? What were you doing? Were you I, was bro- I was brokering. You were I was, broker. I was, so you were calling people. I was calling people. You know, I was just, you know, it was, it was, it was straight I, up. I picture right now, everybody's, yeah. all, all the younger generation is picturing yeah. that scene of Wolf of Wall Street where he's yeah. throwing something. He's like, pick up the phone exactly. and start dialing. Exactly, exactly. Except, you know, it was, it was, a, lot, it was a lot more um, upscale than, than Wolf of, of Wall Street because it, you know, it was a sort of top end, top tier firm. How did you get the job there? Uh, I interviewed. I what did I do? Did you oh, oh, God! This is this 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 was, this was crazy. So I started. Okay, um, I graduated Columbia University, okay. right, in 1985. With a degree in degree in not even a degree in a concentration in economics. I was too lazy to get a degree, so I got a concentration in economics. And to this day, probably it's just how life goes. I interviewed with a Federal Reserve Bank of New York. FX desk, FX spot desk, right? And they were like, they were willing to offer me a job because I was like, you know, this kid out of Columbia that was relatively articulate. And I was like, eh, this doesn't sound so good. Like, I cannot believe to this day that That's I passed crazy. up. Like, this, there were three people in that, at that time making markets for the, for the for FedEx on, on, on the FX desk. And I was like, eh, it's okay. You know, I think I want to try something else. So then I actually wound up getting a job for a financial PR firm, um, which is actually still in business, that used to do like work for stocks. And I was like, you know, I, was, I used to represent a lot of, I had very good writing skills, which has always carried me through my whole life, basically. Um, and I got bored with that about a year into it. And I said, I really, really want to trade. And I actually started cold writing mm. to all these famous brokers. There was this broker named Andrew Lanier, who was like a friend of George Soros's, who was like a really, really famous Hungarian broker. And I wrote him a letter saying, hey, I'm an immigrant just like you. you know, and, I want, and he like actually took me to breakfast early in the morning. He was so impressed with you know, my letters. And then I just realized, you know, maybe I should try um, some of these programs. And that's how I got into you know, the Drexel program. At that time, Drexel was like, like you understand, it was Goldman Sachs, Drexel Burnham and Solomon Brothers. Like that's like that's how Merrill Lynch was like not even you know be, below that. That's how high end it was at that point. Wow. But um, yeah, it was you know it was definitely a, a, a surreal experience. And how long did you stay with Drexel? And I stayed with them for a couple of years, and then actually after the crash, I left. After the crash. Um, and it was funny because I literally left Wall Street for a very very long time. This was um, the beginning '90s or the the beginning of. Uh, the high tech, this is 1985, I think, 
yeah, there was, there was a, this kind of a lull period where, I don't remember what I did in the, in the lull period. Oh, I think I know what it was uh, that was in the lull period. I actually, I went into the restaurant business for a long time because I loved restaurants. There was, there was, it was actually a great experience. I, I, I did front of the house, back of the house. I loved the idea, the, 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 the romance of restaurants after about What type three, of food? Everything, Italian, high end. It was like it was crazy. Falafel. You know? uh, no, no, it was no, just, falafel. Was, no Mediterranean. Yeah. You stick to the, the my the my gravy my, and the my uh, you know my retirement dream, which will never happen, is you know that I'm gonna I'm gonna retire somewhere and I'm gonna create a restaurant called Jews Cook Italian because because I can. I, I, I mean, Jews I, can cook Italian pretty I, well. I can you know I I put put mine up against anybody. As All right, when we I might have to go. To, episode exactly. number two with Boris is gonna be in your my, house. My, You're yeah. cooking and my, we're, my, we're having my food. pasta put the exactly exactly go up against anybody. But anyways, yeah. So I mean, I loved it. But, you know, it was great experience of like, I never want to do this for the rest of my life because it was just it's the most grinding thing. And, and what happened was um, technology had really started to pick up. Netscape had gone public in 1995. Um, and uh, my wife, who was uh, my first wife at that time, who was a headhunter, said, you know, we really should start headhunting all this high tech talent. And we literally just started a business out of our house wow. that just blew up. You can imagine. I mean, I placed people into Google. I placed people into Yahoo. I placed people into Netscape. It was like it was just insane. And that was another great bubble. So I was like I was like the character Zelik from Woody Allen movie. I was at every, you know, high end event in, 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 in history. I was during the 1987 crash, I was right. right on the desk. And then during the high tech bubble, I was literally flying to California every two months to San Francisco. Wow. To place. So here's, this, here's the lesson from that. We negotiated something like 50, $60 million worth of stock compensation for, um, for all the people that we did high technology. How many of those guys do you think cashed in? 2%. One guy cashed in One for $2 guy. million dollars of stock. Everybody else's stock blew up because everybody stayed too greedy. Nobody, nobody cashed out. Cashed out. Nobody yeah. realized their gains. Nobody realized their gains. Lesson yes. number one, everybody. Lesson number one. Realize which, you know, gains. Which, uh, you know, it's funny. Um, you know, it's funny. My, my youngest one, we were, we were at dinner yesterday, and she's like, she's fascinated. Now she's about 11. She's fascinated with what, with what I do. And my, my wife is an ex hedge fund manager. So she's like, you know, mommy trades for. Three years, and she trades for a hundred thousand. Daddy trades for five minutes, and he trades for ten dollars. And I go, that's right. But she's so smart. She goes, she goes, because Daddy wants the money now. I go, that's right. I want the money now. And it's fascinating. She was so brilliant. She understood that all of my early experiences of life taught me that money now right. is much more important than, than money, money later. later. Yeah. yeah, like you, you just know? said, realize. And I am absolutely incapable of doing what my wife does. My wife is incredible at like. She'll hope, you know, she, she's, um, uh, she, she's, she was in Weatherford, which is a, this, this um, uh, drilling company. Okay. It's a 10x, it's a 10x, you know, she bought it at 18, it's like 150. It's a 10x return for her. Wow. I couldn't do, you know, a 10 basis point return. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's also yeah. about knowing yourself. You know Correct. yourself, like yes. you're saying, your background built right. you into this person that's a quick decision maker, right. quick thinker. Right. Exactly. I don't know where this is going to be tomorrow. But also, also my early experiences, because remember, right. also my early experiences, for example, with investing, right? I invest, like, you know, my, 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 my older children, all of their stock money went into the stock market in, two, in 1999, 2000. And by the time they were ready to graduate, it was 2008, and it made no money. You know, mm -hmm. like it was no made no money. So it makes you jaded and, a little bit. And it was a terrible experience because honestly, I've probably given up millions of dollars of not investing money because all my IRA money just sits just in cash. People are like, you're a fucking idiot. I'm sorry, pardon my life. No, no, but, I'm, but, you know, but I'm like, I don't care because right. that's not who I am. Right. You know, I'm perfectly happy just like, like an immigrant to, keep, to, put it, to keep, keep it in the savings bank because I am incapable of just like this long-term investment perspective because my early experiences just taught me Take the money now, well, otherwise the money, the money goes like an ice cube. You, well, I think yeah. when you've been through enough experiences and you've yeah. been around the block a long time, you yeah. see so many other people hold the bag too long, right. like those guys you, that you just mentioned, right. and you learn. You have to be. Yeah, you Before do. we go away from the crash, biggest, yeah. can you just kind of explain to us like that day, biggest takeaway from that day for you long term? I mean, you said you saw grown men crying. So like, oh, what, what, you, know, you went home that day, the, what were you thinking? You, you're not, the, you know, it's like, like was it shock you're, you're in a day, yeah, you're in a daze. Remember, there was a very real chance yeah. that the whole financial system was going to collapse. Was going to collapse. The next day. Right. Because it was a and, Thursday, I believe, okay, right? No, this was, was, it was a Monday. It was a Monday. It was a Monday. Okay, so this, and this is fascinating because I was just listening to, to, to re, you know, documentary replays of it, and I remembered all of it really, really clearly. So that Monday, what happened is Alan Greenspan like, gets on a plane, uh, the market crashes, he gets off the plane, and they say to him, 
it's down 527. He goes, oh, 5.27 5. points? No. That's not too bad? They go, no, 500. 527 points. Right. And he freaks out. And he's like, oh, my God, we, gotta, we have to start pumping money to, you know, we have to start. Um, a money printer. A, a money printer because, you know, uh, everybody, everybody's going to need. And he, he starts calling the banks and telling them, you have to loan. You don't have a choice. You have to. He starts calling Chase and Citi. You have to loan to the specialist because, you know, you don't have a choice. We need so they're like refusing to do it. They try to open the market on Tuesday morning. Specialists have no capital. There's no bids. Everybody is, is, is at offer. The only exchange that actually refuses to close, and, and there's an enormous amount of pressure on exchanges to close, and they're afraid that if they close the stock market, close the NYSE, close everything, they won't be able to reopen them. Right. Just, could there's just, create a run on the banks. Yeah, to create a there'll, be a, there'll be a run on the banks. It'll be like 1932 all over again. Right. Right. And so there was this one guy, I forgot his name, Brett um, something, who, um, uh, who, was a, who was a, he was an options trader, but he basically realized that whenever they closed markets, after they reopened them, they gapped up a lot. Mm -hmm. So he was like, we're gonna go onto the exchange and start buying everything we can before. And he was like, and, and most of the guys weren't even, didn't even have clearance from their clearing firms because they didn't have no money in the account. Yeah. He had money, he started buying, and that created basically the big rally he made the market. at 11, he made the market by himself, 150, you know, contracts of MMI, which was a very, very, like a levered product. Yeah. And um, yeah, and that turned the market. And wow. so the whole point is I realized that, that people think that, you know, there's something concrete to this world. They think money is concrete. Everything, everything is virtual. Everything is in fact an emotion, you know, and that emotion can change on a dime down and change on a dime up, you know. And you have to understand it. So your long term, you know, Warren Buffett said, long term, the market is a weighing machine. Absolutely. But in the short term, little, there, like, there is no reason why S&P could not drop. Well, because of circuit breakers, maybe, maybe. That's the only reason. It cannot drop 20% in a week. Right. Easy. Right. Easy. And you'd be shocked. Right. You know, and you're like, oh, so, you know, these people who have like, oh, look at my return. I, I've compounded for the last 10 years. All my savings, there, my 401k went from 100,000 to 500,000. All the, all the financial planners on YouTube who are very good at projecting, this is how much money you're going to have for your retirement. You're going to, you could wake up very easily with thinking you have a million dollar portfolio for retirement at the age of 65 and at the age of 65 in day one, it'll be half a million dollars. I hope you're enjoying today's video. Just want to give a shout out to the sponsor, Top One Trader. If you're looking to get funded, I've got a link and a discount code for you down below that's going to save you big bucks on your next funding challenge. So thank you to Top One and let's get back to the video. And you will not have any idea whether you're going to get back to a million or not, or whether it's going to take you a year or maybe the rest of your life. Crazy. That's the thing that people I think absolutely don't under appreciate about the, uh, the finicky finicky aspect of financial markets. So let me ask you this. A lot of people say we've had that crash, yeah. Black Monday. Did you know out of the six worst days in stock market history, four of them happened on Monday or Tuesday? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah. But what I was going to say is a lot of people say when those events happen, yeah. the market adapts. We put in circuit breakers. We do, we do things differently right. and it won't happen again. What well, do you say to that? No, no, it will happen again. It will just happen differently. Sure. It always happens differently. The thing that we have learned, which is very, very good, is we've learned, yes, we've learned that, that it's an artificial game. It used to be like, you know, when the, when the market crashed in 1929, they thought it was an act of God, that this is natural, you know, that the markets are a natural way of, and that, you know, and uh, was it Carnegie? I forgot who said, you know, you need to liquidate, you need to liquidate. It, Everything is artificial. Everything is social. Like there's not there's nothing at all natural about markets. It's a social construct. Money is a social construct. As people don't understand. People think, oh, I want hard money, gold. I'm like, it's a social construct. Yeah. You know, it really is. Money doesn't exist. What people don't understand is that you do not have money. You just have a little ledger transaction, whether you have a dollar or a billion dollars sitting. George Jeff Bezos can be bankrupted tomorrow if somebody flipped, uh, f you know, fl flipped the digits in his account. He'd yeah. be worth nothing. Right. It go, it's all completely... Even more now than ever because right. it's so digital now. Right. Yeah. But it's all a social construct. Like yeah. there is no actual value, quote unquote value. And we live in a society. So society fortunately has gotten smarter and learned how to adapt to all of these things. So, so yeah. You think that there still will be things throughout history, as long as markets exist, that cause these black swan events. 100%. Because, because markets are, n n markets always follow the 
crowding behavior, marked by the very nature of human beings, because we're social animals, is to follow the delusion what other, of the crowd, right? There's the we, book. It's not even the delusion, it's just we follow what everybody else is doing, sure. right? Like if you, they do all these experiments where, you know, you, you, if, if everybody's walking towards a certain area, you know, when at, at a concert, you go, oh, this is the line to yeah. go to, right? And you just stand even, there, you even don't even ask that, any that, questions. That could, that could be the line to the bathroom. And exactly. The, and, and the ticket line yes. is, is completely 100%. different, right? So we're all social animals. And so are uh, dogs, like watch dogs. They are, you know, they're like a great example of who we are. We, we think we're much more evolved. We're not. We're basically basically just a, a you know, bigger brain dogs. We all follow a social construct. So when people just, you know, like right now, everybody crowding into AI and crowding into those spaces, that creates such a, ca such a uh, over levered impact that eventually there's a yes. cascade. One guy, it's, it's like a game of Jenga. One guy says, sell, and everybody says, oh, there's no more buyers, and, and then, you know, and that's why, you know, that's why you have like, uh, we had a couple of weeks ago, we had like a three, 400 point, um, uh, decline in the S&P, just like, you know, boom, in the last half hour. Yeah. So handicapped. It's so obvious. You what know? creates these moments? The crash of 19... Nobody knows. That's Nobody the thing. Knows. That's the thing. If you, on, if you, I was there, if you were there on Friday, there was literally no reason. It was no reason. It was just because. And that's the thing. It's not like people love to... to Conspiracy. Uh, ret retrofit history. But they think conspiracy, conspiracy about it. Yeah. There's no, there was zero reason. And that goes back to what I because I talk to people like you who have a lot more experience than me, I've got this opinion about markets that only markets know where they're going to go. Correct. No hedge fund manager no, actually of knows. Of course not. Yeah. But like you said, it could be one of the big guys that starts to sell, another big guy follows, starts to right. sell, the smaller guys start to sell, then it all falls apart, right? right. So exactly. it really just takes a couple of influential people to start to dump right. for us to see a big dump. Correct. Okay, interesting. You know, and that's why, you know, that's why I have such a hard time with all the, the, the furos on YouTube who like think that, you know, if you, if you have a single candle that you can, you can predict future behavior or that, that supply from 1945 on the candle right, is like going it's to, still going like, to matter. I cannot stand ICT. I mean, I just think it's the biggest scam there is in terms of, there's no such thing as a liquidity grab. If you understand how markets actually move, it's somebody who has demand to buy, somebody has demand to sell, and they could care less that you think that there's a wick candle at 45, you know, at, at the 45 level on the ES. You know, if they're going to have enough volume, they'll blow through it. And if they don't, they won't blow through it. That's all it is. I, I like what he does in the sense that he educates people and gets them into markets. I like people like Tim Sykes I had on the show, yeah. like yourself. You get people interested in markets, but yeah. I agree with you. The marketing, the, you know, do you know his story? No. He says that he was kidnapped by the market makers. They tied him up in a warehouse. They told him the secrets to the market, and then yeah. they let him go create a YouTube channel with a million plus right. subscribers. Say, you know, who would believe who, that? Who would believe that? It's like, it's like me being kidnapped by the aliens. You know? Exactly. It's, just, it's, it's, a, it's the stupidest thing. But well, that's, I'm pretty sure you told me that you were yeah. abducted by the aliens. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Okay, know. so wait, let's keep going. So we talked about the crash. We talked about your experience yeah. at the first firm. You took a break, did the restaurant thing. But then you got involved. No, then I got into, then into, high, got into high technology after that, right? right? And then I spent literally like the, the, all the way up to 9-11, I basically... So were you trading during 9-11? Not much. So I was trading just for myself because there was so much money. First of all, so the year 1997 to the year 2000, yeah. the amount of money that was available. Yeah. Like people, I just still, still say to people, you have no idea the IPO craze at that point. The stocks would come out at like, you know, price of 20 200 the next day, oh 400 the day after. The stocks would, you know, would move. You don't see that today. You just don't see that. You don't no. see the kind of moves. I mean, I used to know That is people, crazy. I knew people who were like, you know, who were waiters who would get an allocation of $100 and they would like, they would have, uh, you know, half a million in their account in, 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 in a year. Which That's is crazy. insane. It was really, really insane. What so drove that? I, was that inflows just because everybody was riding the dot-com? Everybody was price. riding the dot-com If bubble, you just put dot-com you know? in your ticker, you, your oh, stock went up. It was just up. insane. There was, there was a, you know, the, the famous one was pet.com, right. which was a, you know, company that, that was, again, 20 years ahead of its time, you know, sold pet food. Um, but, you know, that basically, uh, was, all of them were raising billions upon billions upon billions of dollars. And the thing is, the stocks were trading, you know, like they were trading dollar wide, $50, $50 range per day. I mean, you, you know, you could drive a truck through those ranges. It was so easy. You just go bid ask and you, you know, you, you had a thousand share. It, it was, it, you could make a thousand dollars a minute, which was like, I know people that go crazy. You can't do that now, even in the S&P. It was just insane at how much money there was there. And it was so, all yeah. long, right? Everything was long. It was all long. Nobody's a short seller. Right. Nobody, nobody, was, was, nobody was, was short, right? Of course, because, you know, it, it was just, it was a uni uniform market. And I actually, you know, we'll talk about that. I actually, I think that's the right bias in to trading. To be long. To be long, yeah. You know, this last year, my trading has done really well because of that. 
Yeah. I really stopped selling so, the we'll ES. Get, we, let's, let's yeah, talk, we'll get to that. All right, well, let's, 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 talk, let's, to, let's talk about what I learned about all my own flaws. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, um, I want to talk about FXCM though. Yeah. I want to hear about your time there. Okay. So okay. So what happens then? So 2000, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, 9/11. 9/11 happens. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. You know, the tech business just simply dies, just completely dies, right? Yeah. And I'm just sitting there, basically bored out of my mind, trying to figure out what you know, what do I do next? And I pick up this magazine called SFO, Stock Features Options, which was like a, like, at that time, there used to be magazines, you know? People used to read magazines. Someone listening to this is right. going to be like 13 and be like, what's a magazine? What's, what's a magazine? <laughs> and this lady, like, you know, like some guy wrote an article and um, I was like, about options, right? And I traded options quite a lot. So I'm like, this guy is like 100% wrong about everything he wrote. So <laughs> I, for some reason, I just- Typical you know, Boris take right I was there. Like, I was like- This guy's an idiot. I was like, I decided, you know, the, the the editor's name was on the thing, and I just like they were out of Chicago, and I just decided just on the luck, I called her up and I said, "Can I talk to Gail Austin?" I said, "This article is totally wrong. The guy has no fucking clue what he's talking about," you know. And I just ran and she's like sitting there quietly. She goes, "You so smart. You write the article." For That's me. so funny, you know. And I'm like, "What?" She goes, "Yeah, you so smart. You think you're so smart. You write the article for next month." So I'm like, "I wrote the article." All right. And I was like, "Okay, fine. I wrote the article." And she publishes it, and it like it. At that time, you know, whatever viral of, of what, like, she was like, okay, what are you doing for me? I'm like, well, she goes, what are you doing for me next month? I go, next month? What is, I, I didn't realize I was, I was on contract. You're hired me. now, right? Yeah. She's like, what are you doing for me? So that's how basically what happens. I started writing for her. I just started to express all these, you know, trading opinions that I had. And it was a lot of fun. And then there was an ad for, um, hey, we're looking for an education manager hmm. for this company, this Forex company. I didn't even know what Forex was. Hmm. But it, the, the, the only reason why I responded to it was because it was an overnight position. I was like, oh, this is great. I can work overnight and I can trade, I can trade uh, stock index futures during the day. Sure. Perfect, you know, for me. And I went in and that was FXCM. And hmm. basically what happened is I went in there at 9 o'clock in the morning and those guys kept me there till 7 at night. Drew had literally made me interview every single person in that firm. Really? You know, was interviewing me. And then at, by the end of the day, they were like, you know, we, we want you on we our team. Yeah. And, and, and I just, again, I was, again, I simply landed at the right place at the right time. When I started at FXCM, they were at 55 Water, and they, were, they had a whole, you know, trading floor on the, uh, uh, on the thing, and they had one quarter of the floor. The rest of the, there was literally desks that were just, like, folded down. Right. Just folded down, right. down desk. And within, like, six months, Half the floor was there, and within one year, the whole, the whole thing. floor was there, and within two years, we had two floors on the thing, and it was just Booming. insane. I the 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 insanity of growth that we had in that company was beyond. What all do you think belief. drove that? Well, because forex really took off. You yeah. know, retail forex really really took off. It was the first time people had a chance to kind of get speculate, into get into the market. What year is this? This is two oh four. Right. So we're. Coming out of the yeah, tech bubble crash, right, coming we're out starting tech to move bubble, higher right, now, right. going back towards those right. all-time highs. And, and you know, and then euro, euro, and also it was it was an age of high interest rates. So carry was a really great trade, and there was just lots of volatility. carry is an overnight you know, hold, correct? Pound, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pound yen was trading two fifty, so you know it was like like in other words, the movements in pound yen were like you know two hundred fifty three hundred pips a day. It was you know it was Holy it was amazing. Smokes. Yeah, you know. It was it was a lot it of fun. It moves like eighty now. Yeah, you barely. You barely. Know, like, like the volatility. The, you know, Especially and, euro dollars are now fifty, yeah, euro dollar, sixty. Yeah, correct. You know, like if euro dollar used to move fifty, sixty points an hour. Jeez. Yeah, an hour. Yeah. So it was it was it was a completely different time. It was. It, and you're at this point, FXCM is mainly spot forex, not they futures. Were, they were doing all spot. They never they were futures. They always did spot. No was, options on no the options. Nothing. Spot. They were just doing spot. And you know, and and, and they just blew up. And huge. Because then they became one of like three regulated brokers right. in America that right. were. They went public. They, they, went you know, public. They, right. they became a billion-dollar company. We had left them after the, you know, before they went public because we got recruited by a competitor of theirs called GFT. Okay. And Kathy and I went over there. Got it. And worked there. And then after, and after, you know, we left GFT. Basically, Kathy and I just decided to set up shop by ourselves. And literally, we've been doing that since 2012. Is that it? I mean, I think that's a. Uh, if nothing else, is a testament to just survivability that we're still, still in the business. I think yeah. that's one thing I've noticed as I've sat down with, yeah. like I said, guys with a lot of experience. Yeah. They are hard to kill. You and Kathy right. are hard, <laughs> to hard to kill. That's it. Well, she's really hard to kill. She's she is, really hard to she's kill. She's really hard to kill. What, that's a, when that's did a you two point. first come together, you and Kathy? At FXCM. What, so what happened was at FXCM, this is what happened. At FXCM, I was doing the overnight. She was like director of research, right? And again, I was bored. And I was like, you know, the guys, the sales guys on the desk have zero idea what to say to customers, uh, you know, in the overnight trade because they're like, you know, they were just sales guys. So I'm going to write a note um, 
you know, when I get in in the morning telling them, hey, this is what's happening. This is what the market is moving. This is what the euro is doing. This, this was the data. You know, like a one, it was a one page uh, memo that I used to circulate to sales. And they all loved it. And then Kay saw it and she's like, oh, this is really good. And she had like one page, Daily FX was literally one page, you know, one page website. And she's like, you know, do you think maybe you could, you could do this you know, for Daily FX? I said, yeah, sure, why not? You know, let's, let, let, let's see how it goes. And we literally started Daily FX. That website, by the way, got sold for $35 million later on to, to IG. Wow. But like, that was the beginning. And then by the, you know, within a year, we had like four people working for us. And then, you know, then we had like uh, eight people working for us. And it was just, it was a, it, its own little monster. It became huge. And I still remember, like, the other thing is, how do we get on TV? Because there was very few FX analysts at the time. FX was actually kind of a big space. And, um, um, and I used to just write these really irreverent, you know, pieces like, you know, well, I remember that my first quote that I ever got in Market Watch was, um, I don't know what's, what's more incredible, the fact that Alan Greenspan actually believes the economy is growing or the market actually believed him, you know? <laughs> and, like, and, and I was like, I know I was writing it for myself. I didn't, you know, I was just writing it for sale. But sales. it took off. And like all of a sudden they go, hey, you know you're in Market Watch? I'm like, what? And they're like, Market Watch pulled that code. They loved, they loved anything that was just you know, cheeky. You know? and and, I think what's cool about you and yeah. Kathy, what it seems like is from the jump, you both complemented each other really well. We did. And we, to this day, we're still up because we are absolutely the most opposite human beings Which is you can possibly works. imagine. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, like, I don't believe in, in, in astrology, but we are born literally six months apart from each other mm. to the day. We have the same birthday, but just six months. And we could literally, we are polar like opposites. this, polar opposites in every fashion. So a, to FXCN, they become a big retail broker. Yeah. They're, sh I mean, the main broker for a period right. of time. You know, we travel the world. We, you know, they, they, have, they have global uh, customer base. It are just, they making traders, are traders on their platform making money? Well, or? you know, like, of course not. Like, right. you know, in, first of all, you have to understand exactly. that. Of course not. Of course not. You know, That's why they're booming. Because, that's why they're they, booming. Because guys are trying to trade Forex from their house and getting blown out. Well, you know, the, the point is, look, let's be honest with you. No, if you're trading, right, it, you're in a pool of competition where only like 10 or 15% of people are going to succeed, if right? That. If that, yeah. you know. And that's just the nature of the beast, yeah. you know. In any, in any, like, like does every restaurant tour make money? You know, no. then, 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 you know, like no restaurant would ever go out of this. How many people restaurants go out of business? All restaurants right. are an excellent restaurants. It's, every time you're trading, it's a small business. Yeah. That's what it is. Well, you know, and small business always. The point is that as an entrepreneur, what you need is lots and lots of attempts, right? The more attempts you make, the more success, the more chance, the more times you try a restaurant the more better, likely yeah. you, you're going to get better at it. Yeah. And that's the same kind of a thing of trading. But the reason most people, you know, lose because they quit they in the quit. first, they quit in the first restaurant. You know, you need like 10 restaurants before you actually get a concept that works it's really and get the knowledge going. And that's, that's the thing. So yeah, no, of course people, you know, and, and, and the whole model of, of brokerage was, it, it was, it was a dealer based model. So it means you are in off, in off exchange markets. We'll talk about this with difference between futures and, and CFDs in off exchange markets, the dealers are making the market. Right. That means we, you are trading against the dealer. Now, it doesn't it's not nearly as nefarious as people like make it out. Meaning when they're that taking the other side of your they're trade. Taking, they're taking the, other side. the point is they're not taking the other side of your trade. Correct. They couldn't care less who get, you are. They're putting their you own are, trades on. You are just a, you are an amalgamated number to them. Like there's there's, you know, a thousand of their customers along the euro. Now they're they are short the euro because a thousand of their customers. They're not going after your position. Joe Schmo they could and, they right. could give a flying F about, you know, your position. They're trying to balance their books because that's their job. Their job is to be the intermediary. But, you know, they're just trying to make the spread. They're just trying to balance the books and make sure the position is this. I mean, just, you know, we, we, we got hosted at FXCM. I, I'll tell you what happened. Um, uh, the carry trade, which was um, a trade where, where, where you, you got paid. The carry trade is, is where you uh, buy a currency with a, with a um, high interest rate yield and finance that purchase with a currency with a low interest rate. And at that point, of course, the U.S. dollar and the, uh, at that point, it was actually the pound. The pound had like a like an eight nine percent yield, and the yen had zero because you, you get, Japan has been in zero interest rate policy for, for as long as everybody lived mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, we had a huge Japanese client base. Really, and the Japanese, unlike Americans, have discipline, and they would just literally hold their pound yen positions not for a day, not for a week, not for a month. They would just hold and collect the roll and collect the roll. And in the meantime, the market kept going up and up and up. And our dealer, you know, had a large negative position. And that negative position, like, just, you know, cost the front. We, like, we, we took a 
huge hit. You know, like almost an existential hit. And after that, it was funny. After that, we went to a to a um, what's called an NPP model, uh, where where we um, uh, no no dealing model. We, we just started to pass off the flow to uh, to our market makers. We didn't we didn't want to take any more principal risk because it was too much risk. Because it because that was too much. Because and again, this is a good example. Just one wrong decision. You can make a million great decisions. You make one wrong decision, it, will, it becomes catastrophic. That's what people don't understand about the markets. Crazy. Yeah. Now, the carry trade. Does it? I've heard trader Nick talk about yeah. this a lot. I have guys that are now trading futures and they'll hold some of these positions overnight, get positive right. carry. Yeah. Is that still something you think some of these? Unfortunately, the problem is the interest rate regime right now across the world has brought them all much closer. Has brought them all, and it's so disfavorable. It is. And the, and the dealers dealers used to offer really favorable terms. Now they offer really unfavorable terms. Sure. As a matter of fact, there are play situations now where even if you have a positive currency. You're still getting charged money because yes. dealers will charge you commissions money. or whatever. They're called. Or, or no, even overnight rolls. Like rolls. The, the overnight rolls are actually negative, they, even though they should be positive, because dealers are just don't want to don't take wanna the risk. Take the risk. Yeah. Interesting. So so it, it's far less attractive than it used to be. Okay. But but yeah, it, it still exists. So let's yeah. talk about CFDs and futures. Okay. So you're now involved with a futures funding company. I'm right. now shifting over into futures. Right. I want to talk about the differences between some of these firms, but first, let me ask you about CFDs. Sure. Because you've been around for a long time. Right. CFDs were not allowed, really, by regulated U.S. brokers since 2008 with Dodd-Frank. Is that correct? Right. Correct. So before that, CFDs, which are contract for difference, you could trade them no. in America? The no. C CFDs were never allowed. Let's, never allowed. Let's, let's, let's make that clear. Okay. Um, the reason why CF CFDs are basically a fancy, is just a European term for futures, if you think about it. What, what is a CFD? A contract for difference, and what is a future? It's the same thing. Yeah. It's a virtual contract. It's a contract for, um, uh, for the underlying, right? To deliver sure. a certain amount of underlying at a certain price. You're going to settle that contract at, at a certain price, right? Sure. And typically... Um, futures, because they were hedging products, used to deliver the actual physical product, right? You would deliver barrels of oil or, or bushels, of, bushel, bushels of corn. But when it came to financial futures, they were like, this is stupid. Yeah. Why don't we just deliver the dollar difference because that's what it is. And when you think about it, when you're delivering dollar difference, that's the same thing as a CFD. In a CFD, you're just delivering the dollar difference between what you paid and what, and what the market is now. Sure. And if you win, you get, you get a credit. If you, if you lose, you get a debit. That's all okay. it is. I follow that. Yeah. What I'm, what I was... so, so the point is, the reason why they don't allow them in the U.S. is because... Chicago Market Fellow Exchange, I think. Don't want that. Of course. That's what I was going to say. It's, it's an exact... Because all these different brokers can yeah. make different pricing for these CFDs. It's not just that. You can make... Right now, you know, there's... You can, you can trade oil, you can trade gold, you can trade stock index futures. Mm -hmm. If you trade CFDs in for the rest of the world, you could trade CFDs on Tesla. You could trade CFDs on... Um, on uh, the, 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 the AI companies, on, on, on NVIDIA, whatever. Any financial product can become a derivative, essentially a stub a little stub, a difference between what the current market price is and that. And then, of course, you can lever it. And that's the thing. They don't want, they don't want people to lever it. Right. Now, the regulators don't want to lever it, too, because it's, it, there's two things. It's unregulated. You don't have an actual physical price. It's not centralized. You know, centralized price. Yeah. And that's, that's a big thing. That's a big thing. Yeah. And that's why a lot of people now yeah. that are that's shifting. Why, that's why you saw you know, MFF, yeah. TFF, and all those, all those guys get into trouble. Right. Yeah. And also, they're making their own market, in a sense, where they're using their own that's, broker, pricing the CFD yeah. however they want. Right, right. Now, everybody's shifting over to futures right now, right. and everybody's honestly loving it. Everybody right. that, I mean, I'm sure yes. your community, you're seeing the same thing. Yes. It's like a cleaner market, people are saying. They feel like it's a better place to be. Well, here's the thing about the futures. Whether you're in Dubuque or Dubai, it doesn't matter. If you're trading the NASDAQ, your highest bid first to entry, in other words, your timestamp is first on the end, you will get that trade ahead of every hedge fund in the world. It's a centralized feed. Exactly. That's the whole point. So your experience is uniform anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. That's a huge psychological advantage to people 100 percent. right now that don't you know it's i don't want to like you know uh rain uh water on cfds cfds are are actually priced off of futures if you look at nasdaq cfds or are you they? know us 30 they're all they, what do you think they're deriving their prices from they have to derive their prices off futures because that's a centralized market the, the thing with cfds is um most of the markets are very tight and most of them are not really, you know, in discrepancy because competition creates, you know, you can't have like one guy be five dollars off on Nasdaq. It's right. impossible, right? Uh, because there'll be so much arbitrage. Right. It, it, so it's not like there is a huge discrepancy. But there's enough doubt, you know, in traders' minds, and there's enough doubt on a trade-by-trade on -trade basis. 
that, that certainly, you know, futures have taken, taken off tremendously because of that. Have you seen any or worked with any huge futures traders, guys that have crushed it in certain futures markets? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, we have guys um, at Apex who have, you know, pulled out more than a million dollars out of them. What do they trade mostly? NASDAQ? NASDAQ. I mean, Why do you think that is? Well, NASDAQ is by far the, the most um, volatile. Right. So NASDAQ has two, two advantages. The NASDAQ future. So it, when you trade CFD, it's interesting. What do people trade in CFDs? They trade US 30. Why do they trade the US 30, which is the Dow Jones? Because it's a five-figure product, right? Right? It's a five-figure product. In the US, nobody trades the, the, uh, the Dow Jones because the Dow Jones is a sleepy little index and has like literally 1 20th the volume of the S&P, right? Everybody trades the S&P. But the S&P is a $5,000 product. It's, it's very, very small on a point-by-point on a -point basis, and it's really, really thick, meaning that to move it, you need a lot of volume. So, you know, it's really hard to make more. Now, NASDAQ has the advantage of, of having both, which is it's a big product, it's a five-digit product, and it's really thin. Like, it's, it's 10, 10 contracts per, you know, per level at most, meaning that, you know, you hit, you hit, NASDAQ will go 20 points in, in, in one minute if yeah. you want it to be. Right. Now, 20 points in one minute is $40 on a tiniest, a micro contract, right. $400 on a, on a large. Yeah. You know, you literally could make $1,000 in, 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 in two minutes if you're on the right side of the trade. Right. Whereas on S, you can do that as well on ES. Yeah. It's but just going to be less movement. Less movement. You got to do much larger size. And, and, and again, there's a difference between a thick and a, and a, and a thin layer, a, th a ladder, meaning that the S&P is usually four or 500 up, meaning 400 on the bid, 400 on the offer. NASDAQ is like 10 up, you know, and sometimes it's two up. Okay. And so, so, you know, when somebody decides to sweep the, uh, the ladder, somebody decides to buy all the offers or hit all the bids, it, you know, it just flies. It moves. Yeah, it moves. Would you say that, like, as a new trader into futures, NASDAQ is the right one to be looking at? Well, the great thing about futures, and this is where the CME really kind of, I think, you know, uh, made their bones, they went into something called the micro contract. Right, because they, they opened it up to everybody. They opened up to micro. A micro contract is only $2 a point on the, on the, on the NASDAQ. But so, the commissions on the micros kind of suck. Yeah, the commissions suck. Okay, so this That's is, a typical Wall okay. Street thing, isn't it, Boris? Right, we're right. going to make it so that the, the poor people can trade it, but we're going to charge so, you more. So here's why I love futures prop. Tell me. This is something that nobody ever talks about, and you only understand it if you've traded futures for real like I have, yeah. and you've traded CFDs for real like I have, and you understand all the mechanics of the thing. So if you trade futures for real, mm -hmm. right, I'm not exaggerating, there have been days where I have paid my futures broker $500, and I've made 50. Like, not, no, no exaggeration. That's how much, you, you know, if you're trading frequently, and you do every, every commissions time you will trade, run you up. commissions will just run you up. And these go, oh, that's why you don't want to trade frequently. We'll talk about that, yes or no. Here's the beautiful thing about futures prop. You don't care. It's net net. The, yes, you know, you, the difference is that, that um, in futures prop, you still made that $50, but you don't see the $500 in commission. It's just the $50 net to your thing. And here's the other beautiful thing. On a personal day, like I would have sometimes a day where I would, you know, tough day, lots and lots of positioning. I'd be down three, four hundred dollars by commission price alone. Now I'm like, oh, I'm actually down four hundred dollars. Do I want to make this next trade, right? If I'm in a futures prop, which is virtual money, what do I care? I have zero, zero concern. Right. This is something people completely underappreciate: the ability to be able to trade as much as you want, as many times as you want, because it's not real money. It's hugely valuable because that gives you the opportunity then to come back. Because I've had, you know. 10 bad trades, and if you're in real money, you're like, I don't want to take the, the 11th trade, but it's the 11th and the 12th or the 13th trade that actually recovers the whole value, and I, you know, then I'm up on the day. Yeah. Now, I can do that in futures prop. I can't do it in my own account. The guy that's about to walk in here for my yeah. next interview yeah. has a 14% win rate this year yeah. since uh, the, last, the first two months, January, February. Yeah. He's already been paid out 13K from his futures right. firm. He trades exactly like that. Loss, 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 small, small, small. That 11th trade is the big one. The 11th trade. But and he doesn't talk about commissions at all. Because they don't matter. They what don't do you matter. Care? They, right. Yes, they go against your net P&L. You have, you have a you know, $2,500 budget on P&L, whatever, right. 50000 sure. And it's, what do you care? It's, it's, it's the next trade that matters. You know? It's a great but, point. But you, but you will never appreciate that um, if you've never traded live versus, versus prop. So everybody listening should yeah. take your advice. Yeah. Do you think CFDs are dead in America, or do you think they're going to be worked yeah. around and we're yeah. going to come back? Yeah. I, I mean, maybe, you know, I mean, there's talk Did that... Did you say dead? you think they're dead? Yeah, I think they're dead. There's talk that, you know, if Trump comes, you know, becomes president, they may, they may loosen regulations. I doubt it, because I, my feeling is the Chicago Mercantile guys, first of all, are very, very tight with the 
you know, Trump administration. They must be feeling like they're getting a grip of everything. Why would they let go? Yeah, well, they, they, they literally, I cannot tell you, I think they're like at $200 billion now. I mean, they just, they just literally own the world, you know, as far as, as, far as trading goes. They'll be at a trillion soon. And, you know, and the thing is that I think the other way that's interesting is happening is a lot of um, people from Singapore, people from Malaysia are discovering the beauty of futures, the sort of the, the beauty of centralized markets. They're like, oh my God, you know, uh, you know, there's never, there's never, you know, a, a doubt on my, on my, on my fill. You right. know, I can see my fill. Exactly. So, you know, there's never, there's never an it's argument. You know, there's, no, there's never an argument about, about, about my, my P and L. Right. You know, like and that's all what, you hear in the CFD space right. is slippage and poor execution, and they yeah. screwed me. The broker screwed me. You can't have that. I haven't seen a single futures trader ever say that. Right. And no, so you're going biggest... to you, get, get bad fills. You're going to get you know, crazy vertical moves. And, and this is the thing, the other thing about futures. Um, if you're going to come in with size, mm -hmm. like let's say just even, I'll give you some, this is the other thing. If you go, people go, oh, I trade 50 contracts. I'm like, I know you're lying. Because if you're trading 50 contracts NASDAQ, you won't get filled. And if you're hitting, you're hitting the button and, you, and you're getting filled, it's not, a real, it's not a real deal. Because you... 50 contracts on NASDAQ, you're going to spray it at least four or five wide, meaning that it's going to get five at one level, five at another. It's just not that deep in real life. Sure. And futures prop firms that are using a real market feed, not like a bogus market feed, are going to give you, you know, all those, you know, bad fills. Bad fills. There's just, there's no escaping of, you know, friction, market friction. The key thing that you want is just honesty and transparency, right? That's all you want. You just want, you know, a, you want an accurate accounting of, of all your transactions. That's what I think people are looking for. When you go to barcharts.com and you look at the volume that's coming through on futures yeah. markets, the bonds have yeah. like three times the tenure, has right. three times the amount of volume as right. NASDAQ. Right. Why is that? Do you know anything about bond yes, traders? Because, no, yeah, because it's all institutional. That's the thing. That's right. Like, like, and actually, they introduced the, the micro bonds, which is a you know, really, really good product. And you know, if you have, I think it's, it's fascinating you were asked that because I think FX traders Bonds are very fundamental trade. Yeah. You know, they're a very, very fundamental trade. Based bonds, on interest rates you, it, and yields. It, it, currency is essentially a short-term bond. That's what people understand. Like, you know, currencies are an interest rate yielding bond. It's, it, it's, what is a currency? It's, a, it's like a one-day or a two-day bond because it has a yield on it, you know, attached to it, right? Sure. And so those two markets are incredibly inter Similar. interconnected. Yeah. So, you know, retail traders who are trading... Forex. Forex should look at bonds. Should look at bonds. And, and you know, there's availability now, like really, really nicely. And of course, because, because the micros are fully tied to the, to the big ones, meaning that they're literally tied like electronically. You can't really change the price of one versus changing the price of the other. No. You're going to get a very good, you know, going to get a very good fill. When you were trading futures, even back in the day, because now we have the micros and most yeah. of us are trading the minis. Right. Were there guys trading bigger than minis? Yes, there was the there was the, there was so. the, the full there was the full, full standard the full S and Fiat contract, right. which right. was and that's yeah. going to be another 10x right in terms of tick value right. compared it, to the mini. Correct, correct. It was yeah, it was. So those are the big. Those traders. were the big. Those were the guys, you know. Those were the coming, big yeah, traders. If you trade a hundred full, it was like there was a guy named Marty Schwartz. He had a great book called yeah, of course. Pitbull. Yeah, Pitbull. You know, that's what he did. He traded the full S and I didn't know that. Yeah, was, he, was, he turned eighteen thousand into like. Couple million. That was his yeah, thing. Man, the, a great book, by the way. But a lot of losses. Marty one, lost a lot of money one, in the beginning. One, one of the greatest trading books you can ever Pitbull. read. Not not for strategy, but just the for story. the story and to understand the whole journey process. He's a really brilliant guy. Yeah. 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 Speaking of Marty, yeah. let me just sidebar for a second. I had a question I wanted to touch on. Who were some of the most influential traders you've either met or worked with? Uh, you mentioned the guy that was connected to George Soros that you wrote letters to. Right, Andrew. Uh, well, you know, it's I'm surprised Soros didn't take you in. No, Eastern European Jew know, from know, the know. Brotherhood, bring me exactly, in kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. I do have a, I do have a huge amount of respect for the way Soros trades. You know, you can you can have all sorts of different views. Put the politics Political, aside. For the he crushed aside. it. As a as a trader, he was an, he's a brilliant trader. Savage. And, he's a savage. And, 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 and to do what part he did. of it, and part of it was because he had this. Just relentless East European non sentimental view the of the hunger. world. Yeah. No, a non sentimental view of the world. Like if he was wrong, he was out. He just couldn't care less. Oh, interesting. You know, he just could, he, he would just let go. Unemotional. Of Unemotional in, in, in a way that I think is very hard. On ego. He had like no ego. He had a tremendous amount of personal ego, but no ego when it comes to the market. I think that's a, that's a great thing to separate. You know, you want to believe in yourself, but you, you don't want to believe, believe in your, that you're believe, always right. In believe the in your trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a trade. great, great yeah. piece of advice. You know, who else? Um, you know, so he was great. I've always, you know, Tudor Jones was great. For, you know, like when I was growing up, I, I, I looked at him as a, um, um, you know, as a, still as one a of the best. Yeah, still one of the best traders. You know, it's funny. I um, come on, admit I, it. It's ICT. He's your favorite. Uh, 
I trade very, very differently from what everybody on YouTube trades as. You know, I trade incredibly negative risk rewards. I trade short term. And you and me definitely trade similar. And and I, you know, I'm not very I'm. I'm not very good at giving conventional advice because that's not what I do. You that's know? why I'm having you on the show. Yeah. Of course. So, so you know, if you want to day trade, I'm your guy. If you have a much longer, patient point of view, and you can go for you know two x, three x, four x, those are your trades. If you are a guy who says I'm seventy percent accurate and I have a three x trade setup, you're lying through your teeth. 100%. 100%. Like the single easiest way I know somebody does not actually trade for a living is that sentence. Right. Because we 70% all 70% win rate at three. Because we all know that that mathematically that is impo- that you'd be a good you'd be, you'd be a billionaire right. by by Tuesday. Right. You know, it's right. impossible to, right. to, to achieve. What's that. your win rate, do you think? Do you know? Okay, so the, I trade with a um, so the, what I do, the way we trade or at least the way I trade is um, uh, I trade multiple entries. So it, it's not a martingale in a sense that I don't add to, I never add to a position. I'm in a position, I get stopped out. But then if I go, I'm following a particular trade setup, right? If the trade setup fails, I'll go the next time the trade setup occurs, twice the size, and then twice the size. I will do that up to five times, okay? So that's 31 to one loss ratio. In other words, if I get blown out of my catastrophic, you know, Final, final trade, it's 31 to 1, right? So this is where mathematics really comes in very interesting. If, you're, uh, if the stock market, the stock market is a 55-45 long only trade. If you go back literally from 19, you know, 50s Say that on, again for everybody because that's the, important. The stock market is a 55-45 long only trade, right? Yep. So if you assume, let's say I, I have no edge whatsoever, like my setup is just purely random, it's a 50-50 setup. And you're setup. just buying. And I, you know, no, I'm just saying like my analysis of the market, my technical analysis that, I, you know, that I'm constantly working on, okay. zero actual alpha, like it, zero predict, predictability value. It's a 50-50, it's, it's, a, it's a coin toss, right? Okay. So what happens is um, if it's a 50-50, I lose 31, you know, on every 31st uh, trade I lose. But if I am long only, if I only take long only setups, and they are 55, 45, just, just by the statistics of the market, and it's still a 50, 50, in other words, I have no inherent um, ability to win on any given trade, because my setup is horrible, I'm just guessing, right? That, those statistics put me to 50 to one. So that means if I'm at 55, 45, I will fail one out of 50 times, right? And um, but if I'm trading, you know, uh, one, one, one to two ratios, I'm winning, I'm uh, winning, th- you know, uh, 31 times. So th- that 31 minus 50 gives me 20 wins out of every 50 attempts I make. So in other words, um, when I'm making 50 trades in a row, right, statistically, I'm supposed to lose them all. Sure. But because the stock market is a 55-45, just statistically, no edge whatsoever, I only lose 31, per- 31 of the, uh, one, one out of 31 of those trades. That means I get to keep 20 of those wins. That's basically what I just kind of realized. So basically, like a thirty or forty percent win rate. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, I don't even count it because we. I know, look, I know, I understand the math. We look, we, we look at the trade cycle. We try, for sure. So, so in other words, I'm going to make a hundred trades in a month, just for argument's sake. I'm going to make a hundred trades in a month. I'm going to lose two of those, right, for thirty-one x. Yeah. And so that means I'm going to make ninety-eight um, x the other way minus thirty-one x. I'm going to make like you know twenty x. Makes sense. Right. So you and I trade similarly. I think more than you realize. When I'm trading, I am definitely more long bias, like I was telling you yeah. before, and that's made a big difference for me. My win rate is about 66% this year, yeah. over the last 12 months, but my average risk reward, I'm aiming for one R. If I risk 10 points on the ES yeah. or eight points, I look to make eight, but I'm taking profit at six. Right. I'm taking some off the table, I'm locking right. a stop. Right. Right. So I'm not realizing that full one R gain. Right. And statistically, people will be like, Austin, you're leaving money on the table, you're not following a system. I know that. I, I know I'm using a framework and all I try to do is end the day green. I have a 70% end the day green rate. So right. with Tradezella, have you used Tradezella yet? Oh, yeah, I'd love it. I me love too. It. Yeah, and I, I like it. the guy Umar yeah. that's running the company. Yeah. That's helped me a lot because yeah. it shows me the discretionary edge. You are, as much as that was statistical, but you yeah. just, just, you're very discretionary in your trading, aren't you? Yeah, no. And taking profit and no, taking in trades, yeah, very as, about as, fear. as my 11 year old who knows me better than anybody else. Daddy says, likes da- the quick money. Daddy likes to get paid. She yes. says daddy likes to get so paid. So like for example, yeah. if you take a trade, on NASDAQ with a tight stop. Yeah. 
and let's say it moves halfway to your take profit relatively quickly, what will you do? Okay, first of all, all my trades, my scalp trades on NASDAQ are 10 point stock. Yeah, so okay, that's tight, it. that's just tight. It. That, is, that is just it. But that that's tight. It. Yeah, it's tight. So, you know, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get clipped. So I will sometimes offer it plus five, sometimes I'll offer it plus four, it doesn't sure. matter. I'll, I'll, the great thing about futures is you, you can buy bid. Yeah. You know, I'm always, I always try to buy bid. So to get you a better price. Very much, if you can save the spread, you already have the edge in your favor. 100%. So I buy bid, and then I will, very, uh, I, you know, if, if I'm not at limit, like if it's not quite getting to my limit, I'll just, uh, try to offer at offer at ask I'll, yeah. I'll sell at ask yeah. that alone will just you know give me the spread so the way I work it is my first trade remember I have like let's say five trade cycles I'm gonna I'm gonna do the same trade five times as it sets up right in the first time that it, it gives me the signal I may get out early because I don't care because because you know again I have no risk remember I, I'm not I've not lost anything the second trade I've already lost 10 points. So now I've got to make at least five points just to get the break even. So maybe I'll go to plus seven, plus eight and get out of those, right? But a third trade, fourth trade, I've got to manage those pretty, essentially at 10, 10, yeah. you know, at that point. So yeah, so you know, you, you, it, it all becomes a little bit discretionary, absolutely, you know. How long do you trade each day? So I'm a junkie. And again, this, this, there is zero reason you need to trade the way I do. There's, there are guys in my yeah, room. You and me just like it. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> just like it. Exactly. Yeah. Like, like on Friday, I did 34 trades. I start at four in the morning, and I'll, you know, and I'll trade to like. When you trade in that early, Nasdaq. Nasdaq. Yeah. I mean, you know, like you get, you get good volume at four in the morning. You get the European. The, the thing is, if you watch the markets, there are certain very repeatable behavior patterns. Sure. I'm sure you've noticed them. Yeah. For example, London Open, New York. There's open. a London Open. Yeah. There's a London Open. Depending depending on where we're at, you know, it's going to be if 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 the market is is bullish, they're going to they're going to sweep it up, and you, you have a chance to just you just, you just buy the breakout. I I will tell you something very very funny. These I mean I have I have lots of interesting algos. We have written great algos both for CFDs and for futures. Ninja Trader algos, uh, all of them, you know, all my programmers are working really hard over time in getting this stuff, and it's great. And if you are like sort of, you just want to do algorithmic trading where you just take one of my setups and it automatically trades it, it's great. But these days, I trade nothing but the eight period moving average. That's it. That's it. That's it. You know, I am looking, and it's unbelievable at how, how much money is. is, you know, how much money you can scalp out if you're just on the right side of that average. That's it. It's insane. And how many people will try to fight that average as it's moving higher and they try to sell it and sell it and sell it. And it's just like, throw a yeah. buy in and shut up. What, I, mean, I, I, you know, this is, this is where it really opened up my eyes. So I, I, I had, I, you know, I'm, I'm running like my, I already passed a couple of, you know, Apex accounts and, I, and I'm running the next one um, in a very, very methodical small manner where I'm just, you know, trading very, very small numbers. So I have a huge amount of data at this point, like 500 trades. And when I look at my trades, literally 90% of my wins are on the long side. And there's like maybe a hundred dollars worth of like on the, on the short I, side. And why? Because I, this is my greatest, my greatest uh, weakness is I am a non-conventional person like you. I like to fight the crowd. And I'm like, you know, if it's, high, if it's going up, it's going up. Middle I know, finger I'll, to I'll, the middle, authority. Middle yep. finger. I, John, Mel, John Cougar Mellencamp, I fight authority, authority always wins, was literally my <laughs> theme song, a theme song of my whole life. <laughs> But I realized, you know, you're a moron. You're literally a moron. In the markets, it don't pay to it be does, like that. It, it does, it does can, we can like be that. like that outside right. the markets. That's why I say, you know, it doesn't matter if you're trading the one-minute chart, the 10-minute chart, the daily chart, the weekly chart. Buy the freaking dip is literally the, the, um, the strategy in the market. There's only two positions you really want to have. You want to be flat or you want to be long. Mm, right there. That's a good nugget yeah. right there. <laughs> Because of market drift, correct? Because of market because drift. Of inflows, because, because of inflows, because of pension funds right. and all the money it that just, flows into the market. And yeah, and this is this is very specific to the U.S. stock market and maybe the German stock market. In other words, it's specifically for growth economy, growth right. capitalists. This isn't Japan. This is this not the pound. This right. is not the U.K. stock market. It's not the FTSE. Right. This is different. It is right. America. Although Japan, Japan is now almost at, at, at is it at all time highs? Almost highs. You know, good people, for them. Twenty, yeah. thirty years later, yeah, it's here very hard to trade the Nikkei. The Nikkei. You know how I know you're not a short? Yeah, you still have your hair. <laughs> all the bears i know the people like no no no, no offense lucci lucci is one of the options guys he's uh, a notorious short got yeah. no hair uh, it, the, the shorts against the market age yes. you it's it, very it, difficult it ages you. It and we all look at the market right. and we all go like right now ai ai yeah, is yeah. and it's a one stock market almost right, nvidia right. now they just added a smci to the smc right. at all-time highs basically yeah, I, it, it's a one 
yeah. sector market, right. you know it's got to pull back. Right. But that doesn't mean to be short. No. 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 And, it's always, and it's generally, the rule of thumb when you're shorting is that it will pull back after you're margined out. Mm. It's always, that's the number one rule of life. It's, it's when you're stopped out that you're going to be pulled back. Wait, do you other. see this episode I have going up this week with yeah. Gary Cardone? It's Grant Cardone's brother. Oh, yeah. He had seven margin calls against him on Bitcoin last year. Uh-huh. Interesting. Interesting, wow. right? Yeah. Last thing. Yes. Speak to the audience about anything you'd like to share when it comes to the prop firm CFD funding space that you think they should know. You've been involved in so, it for a long time. Right. So here's the thing. There is absolutely no better way to learn the markets than to trade an evaluation prop account um, because it puts you into the exact same mindset and the exact same prices that the market is, is involved in without any personal risk. Just think about this. If you're lucky, yeah, maybe you'll get funded for $50,000 at a cost of like, you know, $100 buy-in. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. The, that's, not the, that's not the value of it. The value of it is the actual process of learning. You can take two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten of those um, accounts, and you'll still never spend as much money as you would on your one account that you funded for yourself. You can lose $1,000 in futures in one day flat. You couldn't do that in, in, in evaluation you know, cases in one month or two months. And it's the process of learning, learning about who you are, what you are, you know, and what the markets are, that is just invaluable. And then, you know, if you get good at it, you're funded, again, with no risk of your own money. I just, I don't know of any, it's, it, it's the ultimate asymmetric. People always talk about, I want to trade 10x trades, I want to trade 100x trades. It's the ultimate 100x trade. You, 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 you spend 100, you may be able to make 100,000 if, you know, if, uh, at, the end of, at the end of the journey. Even if you make 5,000, the asymmetrical payoff is just tremendous. It doesn't, the other thing is, you know, people are focused on trading for a living. Don't. Trade for life. Meaning, make it a gig, make it a hobby. You, you get, if, if you trade well, you get to a point where you say, I, doesn't matter what the market is, doesn't matter what the market does, I will be able to make some money out of the market at any given time because I know I have the day trading skills to do so. And that is an incredible sense of accomplishment and um, confidence that you cannot have anywhere else. And that's what you know, prop trading really gives you. That's why I'm, I'm a huge believer in it. Um, you get the chance to really participate in the markets without blowing up a huge amount of personal money. I love it. Yeah. Where should everybody find you? BK Traders? BKTraders.com or at FX Flow. You can tell, you know, like I, even though it's, uh, I no longer trade FX. Although Dude, I, you I, and me both, we're stuck with FX in our freaking tag handles. Exactly. We're not even trading, exactly. trading, uh, exactly. Forex anymore. Trade, trading futures and Forex, right. But yes. But it's fine. I, I still trade, by the way, tons of CFDs. Um, you know, and we have a we have a great relationship with a uh, with a, with a CFD broker called ACAP, who we love. So uh, there's, you know, it's not one or the other. It's j just different products, and they're all really, really valuable, and they're all really great. And I think uh, people should do it. And this is this is the this is the way to, to put your toe in the water. This is really the perfect way to enter the markets. And, and the, also, everybody, make sure you check out Boris on the Trading Battle. He's hosting the Trading Battle. Show. Right, exactly. And we trade that. the Trading Battle, which is great because there you get a whole bunch of different traders with completely different mindsets and approaches. Really fascinating to, to delve into their methodologies. Uh, so hopefully, you guys will like that. Last thing. Yeah. Who is one trader that you know that I need to sit with for the podcast? Who would be an interesting conversation for me? This is our second one. We did a virtual one. Now we're in person. We're already like, this you know, is, you know how I am. Who do you think I should sit with? This is tough. Um, Maybe your wife. Would she be down? No, my wife is not. A, this is the interesting thing. My wife would be an excellent interview. Yeah, she worked uh, with a hedge fund. She's worked for many hedge funds. Right. Precisely because she's not a trader. My wife is the exact opposite of a trader in a sense that my wife is a old fashioned value investor, uh, long short hedge fund investor. And what she will do is she will find um, a story that is divergent from where the market thinks the story is and will hold on to that position through thick and thin and, you know, dominate in ways that I never could. Like, strong you know, conviction. Strong conviction, strong uh, analysis, and more importantly, um, the ability to kind of manage that position really well. You know, like my wife is up a factor of a hundred versus me in terms of in terms of the accounts this year because you know she's she's so strong fundamentally. And there are people who really, really like trading that way. Like in other words, trading positionally, trading trading fundamentally and holding on to your convictions really, really well. Um, so yeah, she's 
Definitely. I'll let you think Def about it then for, agree, for yeah. a guest. If you don't think she'd be great, I'll let you. Because yeah. you know so many people, so you've got to yeah. give me somebody good. Yeah, no, I, I, I got to think. I'll, I'll come back to you okay. on that. Yeah. All right. For everybody Thank listening you. all the way through, we appreciate you very much. Make sure you follow Boris, connect with him. All the links will be down in the description. Boris. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So great to have you with it. Thank you. Bye.